Hello, I'm Mr. Eliasson, and welcome to APUSH. Today we're going to discuss the critical period, when the Articles of Confederation faces a series of different challenges stemming from the end of the Revolutionary War. The delegates to the Articles Congress are going to do their best to deal with these challenges, and in the end, we're going to navigate through the process by which they decide to throw the whole thing out and create their own government. Sorry, spoilers. So, here are our objectives for today, and let's dive into the narrative. The Articles of Confederation was an inadequate government for a whole bunch of different reasons. It did the things it needed to do to allow the American colonies to win the war for independence and to establish themselves as their own independent country, but it failed in a whole bunch of important ways. For example, because they didn't have the ability to allocate money, they were unable to create a navy which prevented the United States from fighting against or from being able to effectively resist the Barbary Pirates, a group of northern African pirate states who Previously, the British Navy had somewhat defended us against, but at this point, for what I hope are obvious reasons, the British Navy withdrew their support, and we began getting into our ships, began getting attacked by pirates, our crews taken hostage and held for ransom, and we could do very little about it because, again, no Navy. The Articles also failed to, to deal with the problems of Western claims of different colonies in that they really had no ability to regulate claims between the colonies. And because they had no judiciary, there was no court but that the colonies could go to in order to solve, like, what are the actual borders of these, of these states? How do they relate together? What's going to happen to Western lands? Although they will eventually deal with that. And uh, so how do, you establish, how do you deal with border conflicts between states? Uh, you really don't particularly well. They also couldn't regulate trade amongst the states, and they couldn't impose tariffs, and they couldn't tax states, and all, st all the states coined their own money, and there was no president to enforce the law, and each state had equal representation, and you needed a supermajority to pass anything. So, I mean, this is a laundry list of barriers to the Articles being successful. The goal of the Articles was to establish a non-tyrannical government, and the Articles government was absolutely not tyrannical, but it was also not up to the task of solving the problems that the new United States was facing. And so, Alexander Hamilton here states that, quote, there are important defects in the system of federal government is acknowledged by the acts of all those states which had occurred at the present meeting, and the defects upon a closer examination may be found greater and more numerous than even these acts imply. And so we start, to, we start to get a push to call a co some sort of Congress to amend the Articles. This starts, uh, this first Congress is the Annapolis Conference, where it's more or less like Hamilton and Madison hanging out and like trashing on the Articles. And because you only have five states showing up, they were able to publish enough propaganda to convince others that another meeting was necessary. But five of 13 states is not enough to effectively amend the Articles. I mean, honestly, you need 13 states to amend the Articles. But it's not really enough to get enough consensus to create a new government. So they decided instead of Annapolis, Maryland, they're going to go to Philadelphia, home of America's founding grandfather, Ben Franklin, because he's going to add some different gravitas. The economy of the, the thing that pushed for this new conference was the economic collapse of all the states. The Congress couldn't pay money, couldn't pay the money to the soldiers, they couldn't pay back their debts, and every time they tried to pass any sort of imposed tax, any sort of export tax or anything else, it was blocked by one state or another. Generally, states like Delaware kept throwing up roadblocks because they imported almost all of their goods, and so they didn't want to have to pay the higher prices that an impost would create, despite the fact that without it, the government had no ability to generate revenue, so couldn't pay their debts, couldn't back their money with anything, and the whole thing is going to fall apart. Then there's also Shays' Rebellion. Shays' Rebellion broke out as the, con as the Constitutional Convention was meeting. Shays' Rebellion was a rebellion of Western Massachusetts farmers who had served in the Revolutionary War, had been paid in worthless paper money, and then once they got home, they realized they owed significant debts on their farm. They tried to pay it off with said worthless paper money, and the whole thing totally, and uh, no one would accept it. So the, the courts started foreclosing upon their farms. They felt like this was super unfair, and they also realized, hey, we've still got our guns from the Revolutionary War, and we're re relatively well-trained soldiers, so we're going to shut down the courts, shut down the government of Western Massachusetts, and, put, and uh, put significant pressure on the government to just relieve these debts, or at least, please, stop taking our farms. Seriously. We fought in this war for independence, now we're coming home and having our farms taken away? Really? And you're not accepting our money? Guys. So. Daniel Shays becomes the ringleader of this rebellion, and the government of Massachusetts struggles to put it down. 
Here we see Benjamin Lincoln's letter on Shays' Rebellion, quote, <clears throat> While they're in this situation, they will never be reconciled to government, nor they will submit to the terms of it, for any other motive than fear excited by the constant military force extended over them. Basically arguing that we need to put this down by force. Uh, Thomas Jefferson famously said that uh, a little bit of rebellion is necessary and sound medicine for the health of government, and said that the, the tree of liberty must be occasionally watered with the blood of patriots and tyrants. But again, it wasn't his state that was burning down, and I think if we were having a Bacon's Rebellion round two, TJ might have felt slightly differently about this. In Massachusetts, uh, they're somewhat worried about this. Sam Adams, uh, who you'd think would be in support of rebels protesting against the government, said that, quote, in monarchies, the crime of treason and rebellion may admit to being pardoned or lightly punished, but the man who dares rebel against the laws of a republic ought to suffer death. And so, no sympathy from Sam Adams. And John Hancock, uh, who you also think would be sympathetic, is now the governor of Massachusetts. He didn't know how to deal with this problem, but he came down with a convenient illness, <coughs> cough, cough, and decided to take a break for a little while and resign the governorship. In the end, a guy named Bowdoin took over, and Bowdoin sent out the militia in order to try to put down the rebels. Uh, the problem was the militia was also made up of mostly former Revolutionary War veterans who were in debt and very sympathetic to Shays' rebels. So instead of suppressing the rebellion, they simply joined it. The government also passed the Riot Act and suspended, suspended habeas corpus in order to arrest these rebels. But again, without any enforcement power to do so, that's not going to happen. They asked the Articles Congress, the, uh, the, Art the Confederation Congress for money, and all the other states said, no thank you, we don't have any money or troops to spare. And so Western Massachusetts is basically this hotbed of rebellion and destruction. In the end, the merchants of Boston have to pass around a hat and raise a private militia, and they put down Shays' Rebellion on their own. But it was incredibly expensive, and it showed everyone the, the general weakness of the Articles of Confederation, increasing the, uh, increasing the calls for this Constitutional Convention. And so, almost all the states, with the exception of Rhode Island, sent delegates to the Constitutional Convention. The original plan for a new government was written up by James Madison. Madison and Hamilton had already decided that the Articles was fatally flawed and needed to simply be discarded. So Madison wrote up a whole new plan of government called the Virginia Plan, which had two, uh, two bicameral legislatures proportional to population, had the three branches of government we know today. And so he showed up and presented this plan, and the delegates debated on it. In the end, we don't know anything about their debates beyond the letters that they wrote each other because the meeting was closed and, you know, and they, uh, they didn't have any specific record of what was said. Apparently, Hamilton proposed at one point that the president and Senate serve life terms, but that was not amenable to the, most of the other Republicans. And so in the end, we came up with a series of compromises. Oh, and I should say, they invited George Washington and Ben Franklin there in order to provide gravitas to the whole situation. Because the, thing, the problem with the Constitutional Convention is there's absolutely no legitimacy there. The Articles government is the Articles government. You need 13 states to amend the Articles. Rhode Island refused to send a delegate at all. So no revision of the Articles. And what right do they have to throw out this government and write a whole new government? Absolutely none. But if you have such living legends like Ben Franklin and George Washington on, on, on the uh, committee, even though George Washington again notes, quote, the legality of this convention I do not mean to discuss, nor how problematic the issue will be, but powers are wanting, none can deny. And so he's going to be in support of this new government. And so with the support of such famous figures, the Constitution is going to be added, given added weight. In the end, again, the debate was pretty fierce. Uh, Alexander Hamilton provided, again, some other suggestions. And in the end, we came up with a series of compromises. We have the division of powers, this federalism thing, in which state government we have state governments, local governments, and then the federal government. Power is divided up amongst the House of Representatives and the Senate. Uh, we have a legislative, executive, and judicial branch. In the end, the president is going to be chosen by presidential electors who are going to be influenced but not tied to the people. And the Senate is going to be elected by state legislatures rather than the people. And so the only, pe the only group that the people actually represent or are elect are the House of Representatives, where all the other groups have a second layer of voting in order to ensure that the candidates that are elected are, are responsible and up to the task. The Great Compromise watered down watered down Madison's original Virginia plan by combining it with the New Jersey plan. 
The New Jersey plan was to keep a government similar to the Articles government, whereas the Virginia plan had, had representation based on population. And so the Great Compromise is a bicameral legislature, one, based on population, the House, directly elected by the people, and two, when the other one, equal in representation, two senators chosen by state legislatures. This solved the large slate, small state problem. The less impressive compromise is the three-fifths compromise because there was a question as far as when you're appointing both representatives and tax burden, you have to count population, but who counts as a person? Are we gonna count enslaved people as people? Well, the North argued that enslaved people should be counted as people for tax, tax purposes and not counted as people for representation. The South argued that the enslaved people should be counted as people for representation, but not for taxes. So the three-fifths compromise is that enslaved people get to be three-fifths of a person for both. So that's a thing that's in the Constitution. The major sticking point as far as ratification and getting people on board is Article 1, Section 8, Clause 18, which I'm just going to give you in its entirety here because it's kind of important. So, quote, <clears throat> Congress shall have the authority to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers and all other powers vested by this Constitution in the government of the United States or in any department or officer thereof. This was super problematic and became known as the either the necessary and proper clause or the elastic clause, depending on how you felt about it, because the definition of necessary and proper is incredibly vague. Because necessary and proper is not clearly defined, there's a real question as far as how much power this gives the federal government, and this became a huge sticking point, especially for the group that's going to become known as anti-federalists, who worried that necessary and proper could mean literally anything you wanted it to mean. The framers of the Constitution argued that it was necessary because laying out a series of enumerated powers only allows Congress to do the things that they could imagine at this moment, and they understood that as history progressed, Congress was going to need to be able to do things that weren't explicitly listed in here because, you know, uh, establishing post office and post roads are good, providing and maintaining a navy, and defining and punishing pirates on the high seas are all important, but what if we need to, like, regulate communication? Is that, a is that necessary and proper as communication advances? I mean, the framers thought it might be. So we divide into these two opposing camps. The Federalists, generally led by Madison, Alexander Hamilton, and John Jay, argued for the Constitution and argued that the checks and balances would protect against abuses. The Anti-Federalists, Led by, led by Patrick Henry, Richard Henry Lee, George Mason, Sam Adams, were preferred stronger state governments and worried that the necessary and proper clause would give the federal government the power to become tyrannical. So, as the states, so we, they also decided to create special ratification conventions in each of the states rather than allowing the state legislatures to ratify because they were worried that the state legislators would be loath to give up their power. And so the, every state created these informal special ratification conventions. And they argued that nine of 13 states would need to ratify the Constitution before it went into effect. So eight states had ratified it at this point, And the real kicker was going to be Virginia and New York because if one of the other small states jumped in and ratified it, you know, uh, Rhode Island or something, the Constitution would go into effect. But if the two most populous states, namely Virginia and New York, did not ratify the convention, then there's a question as to whether or not the Union would break apart. And could we really have a United States with uh, South Carolina as part of it and Virginia and New York as not part of it? That's a real question. So there was incredible pressure put on these two states to ratify it, understanding that this is incredibly important and this is incredibly important. And if these states don't get in, the union itself might collapse. Because of this, we get a series of a pro propaganda known as the Federalist Papers, trying to persuade people to ratify the Constitution. Uh, they weren't super well read during the time, but they're important to us because they allow us a vision into the framers' mind. So here's Hamilton's Federalist number 30, arguing that, uh, here's Hamilton's Federalist number 30. Here's James Madison's Federalist 51. You should definitely pause and take these in because, again, they're windows into the framers' minds as they are, as they are trying to argue for the Constitution. So here's Hamilton's 78, arguing uh, about judicial review. And here's an anti-federalist paper arguing that the elastic clause is going to become absolutely, is going to allow Congress to do whatever they want, and this unbridled power, this absolute power will corrupt absolutely. 
These Federalist Papers, again, have become sort of the Bible for interpreting the Constitution, and they become the heart of American government and the center of this new American civic religion. So if you're interested, you should 100% go and read the Federalist Papers. They're long, they're a little dry, but they provide a window into what the people who wrote and pushed for the Constitution thought it should, thought it should do. In the end, both Virginia and New York did ratify, Virginia ratifying first and New York ratifying later. Virginia ratified because of pressure from guys like Thomas Jefferson and, and James Madison. New York ratified because, as you can see here, New York City wanted the Constitution because they wanted a navy to protect trade. Upstate New York did not, and so New York City threatened to secede from the rest of the state, sign the Constitution themselves, and become you know, the representatives of New York. And so with the idea of being cut off completely from the coast, eventually enough New York delegates were able to ratify. And the final state to ratify was Rhode Island, who was worried that they would disappear into irrelevance in a massive union with all the other states, eventually not ratifying until two years after the Constitution went into effect. You can see here in generally coastal areas and New England supports the Constitution. Also some areas in the back country that are getting attacked by Native Americans, whereas rural areas tended to be more skeptical of giving the federal government increasing powers. The final thing that convinced the Anti-Federalists to ratify is that James Madison said that we would amend the Constitution ten times to provide strict limits on the power of the federal government to prevent the Elastic Clause from becoming massively tyrannical. These ten amendments became known as the Bill of Rights, and people are probably more familiar with them than they are the actual text of the Constitution. They provided all the essential civil rights and freedoms that are at the heart of American civil rights. And they provide, as we said, strict limits on the power of the federal government to use the Elastic Clause to oppress the citizens. So the Bill of Rights was absolutely essential in getting Virginia and New York and eventually Rhode Island to ratify. So everyone ratifies. Now we've got a new government, the Constitution. So we'll pick up next time with the beginning of the Constitution, the election of our first president, and the beginning of what we recognize as American history. Thank you for listening.